McQuistian for over 28 years talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation, helping to educate the public about the fundamental principles of their democracy and thus be in a position to help formulate public policy. The University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. Well, welcome to the program. I'm Dennis McQuistian, and I'm joined with my co-host, Jim Falk. Jim, how are you today? I'm really looking forward to today's topic. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, well, it's going to be about philosophy. And before I introduce our guest, Jim, you've read, I think, one of his books, something about geography and genius or something. So tell us just a bit about that. Well, I think Eric's figured out a pretty good gig because almost every one of his books starts with the word geography. And as our viewers will soon hear, he goes everywhere, preferably by train. Yeah. The geography of genius, the geography of bliss. And although the word geography is not in this book, he's gone everywhere following, as he'll tell us, the dead philosophers. Exactly. And we're going to talk about what we can learn from dead philosophers. Eric Weiner is the author of several books, and one, including one, as Jim mentioned, the New York Times bestseller, Geography of Bliss, which has been translated into 20 languages. And of course, we're going to be talking about mostly his new book, which is called The Socrates Express. And so uh, Eric's background is national public radio. For a lot of years, he's been in 30 different countries from Iraq to Indonesia reporting the, the news of the day. And uh, you'll see that travel is his number one thing, as far as I can tell. And he writes a column now for BBC Travel. So, Eric, welcome to the program. Thank you, Dennis. I'm delighted to be here. I was gonna say, we want to know, Eric, about why you wrote this book about philosophy and a little bit about what philosophy is before we get into who those philosophers are. Uh, good question. Uh, I wrote the book the same reason I write all my books. I was on a personal quest. Uh, I was hungry for wisdom. And I really felt that the usual sources weren't working for me. Religion offers some source of wisdom, certainly pop psychology, others. But I thought there was this untapped source out there called philosophy. And I wanted to find out more about it and resurrect it in my mind and the minds of the readers as something actually useful in your life. Eric, why do you think that now philosophy doesn't really get very much attention in, in, in schools? Is it because we're just so focused on getting a job and we have to look at STEM as the, as the panacea of all? Yeah, so I'm gonna answer that question by quoting a philosopher, Plato, who said, what is honored in a country is cultivated there. And we don't really honor wisdom as a culture and as a society. We certainly honor knowledge and information and technology, as you said, but we don't honor wisdom. And that is where the word philosophy comes from, from the ancient Greek philosophia, love of wisdom. A philosopher is someone who loves wisdom. And it's become this, you know, this arcane subject, something that is difficult in college that uh, you, you're parents really wish you would not have majored in because it's not gonna land you a, a well-paying job. Um, but philosophy is about wrestling with these big questions, not just metaphysical questions about, you know, why is there something rather than nothing, but really practical, meaningful questions about how to live richer lives, how to do the right thing, how to be a better person. These are questions I think that should matter to everybody. Well, I think you're right. And we did a program years ago uh, called Philosophy, Who Needs It? And it was um, one of the people we had on was the follower of Ayn Rand, who is a philosopher you know, and is not one you wrote about because even though she is dead now. Um, but I, I think that you would, in your book, say that we all need it, basically. And I, I want you to talk a little bit about Marcus Aurelius to start with. And I want to mention one thing about what I liked about his chapter, because he talked about getting out of bed in the morning, something I can't do, don't want to do under any circumstances. I never thought about Aurelius as a philosopher, number one. So give us a bit about him. Okay, well, Dennis, you 
clearly have something in common with a Roman emperor. Um, <laughs> I don't know what else you may have in common, but he was a Roman emperor, first century AD, and he was an amateur philosopher. Um, he was very much into Stoicism, but he read the others as well. Uh, and we know him mainly through this book called Meditations. That was really a, a journal that he kept, uh, notes to himself. Uh, and it's a remarkable work, considering that it's several thousand years old. It seems just so relevant today. And as I was reading it, I noticed that he kept saying, when you have trouble getting out of bed or complaining that he can't get out of bed. And I thought, he's just like me and like Dennis, he can't get out of bed. And he wrestles with that question. And uh, I take some liberties with his wrestling and come up with my own philosoph philosophical technique for getting out of bed. Do you want to hear it? Yes. Okay. So it's basically you think, how can I be useful to other people? Um, you, it's hard to get out of bed when it's just for yourself. I think if people who live alone might have trouble getting out of bed, but if you've got a child or a dog or someone who's, who needs you, uh, that's going to get you out of bed. And Marcus had, you know, several million Roman citizens and followers who needed him. So it's ultimately that sense of, I wouldn't say obligation, I would say duty. Um, he was very much into that sense of duty and uh, it got him out of bed. Eric, I'd, I'd like you to talk about how you selected some of the philosophers and, and how you divided it up from dawn, noon, and the end of our lives, dusk. All right. So uh, how did I choose them? Very carefully, because it's not easy. If you Google philosopher, you will find hundreds, if not thousands of entries. There are lots of philosophers through the ages. Many of them are dead, in fact. Um, and so I really went with my gut, Jim. I, I, I chose ones who spoke to me, ones who were imperfect beings like myself, misfits to some extent, um, didn't quite fit in, um, and ones who who really asked these personal questions, who took philosophy very personally. And uh, the idea of dividing it from dawn, noon, and dusk was that, you know, we, these how-to questions, each chapter is a how-to question, like how to get out of bed, uh, how to wonder, how to be, you know, how to uh, cope with difficult situations, how to grow old, how to die. Well, those questions have different prominence during different stages of our lives. Um, so the dawn, noon, and dusk mirrors our lives. The questions as a young person that you ask, the questions as someone in the peak of your life you might be asking, and questions about old age and death and coping that, that really come to the fore later in life. We talk so much now about how we cannot have civil discourse, and maybe you can boil it down to the fact that we don't know how to listen to others. What philosopher should we read, should we consider to understand to improve our own method of perhaps communicating with people we disagree with? Hmm, two come to mind. Schopenhauer, who was a pretty grumpy German philosopher, but very much valued listening. He loved music and had a whole philosophical theory of music. Um, but he also thought it was important that we listen to our own voices. Now, he's writing in the 19th century, Jim, but he's warning about the dangers of multitasking and the dangers of turning to books for answers instead of turning inward. And you can just substitute Google in the internet for books and you see what he's talking about, um, not listening to your own voice. You can't really converse well with others if you're not first listening to yourself. So Schopenhauer would be one. He wrote a series of fabulous essays, uh, some of them on listening. And the other is actually Mahatma Gandhi. Um, who was very much about conflict and about fighting um, in the best way possible. Um, and Gandhi famously said that he had many adversaries, many opponents, but no enemies. He didn't see his opponents as enemies. And unfortunately, in America today, we tend to see anyone who disagrees with us as an enemy. And that is not constructive, to say the least. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it, Eric. And when, we, uh, when you and I and Jim look into this camera, uh, we are looking at that viewer, of course, but we're also in some ways looking at ourselves. And you, you write about Socrates and one of the things that I think he's known for is sort of knowing himself and, and asking questions. I'd like you to talk about that. And before I mention that though, we, we've often talked back, we did a program on Peter Drucker a few years ago and 
Peter Drucker believed that a consultant appeared ignorant and asked pertinent questions. And Jim and I have, were born appearing ignorant. We're just trying to learn the questions. All right. So what can Socrates help us with there? Socrates was the king of the question, right? I mean, that's what he did. He had no theories, no fancy, you know, architecture of knowledge, no metaphysics. He basically went around ancient Athens annoying people by asking these ignorant questions, almost like a five-year-old who responds to your every question with why, why, why. Um, Socrates was a bit like that. So um, he goes around Athens and he asks uh, people like a general who should know about courage, what courage is, simple question. And soon dawns on Socrates, a general doesn't have a clue what courage is. The poet doesn't know what beauty is. All these people who should know, don't know. Uh, it was the case of the emperor not having any, any clothes on. And so Socrates would press them and press them in what is now called the Socratic method. But it's basically a series of questions and answers and and at its best, ideally, it is not combative, right? It's not confrontational. It is two or three people getting together, wrestling with big questions by probing each other and trying to come at, up at a bigger truth. Um, for Socrates, philosophy was conversation. And he would say that what we're doing right now on this program is philosophy. We are discussing big questions and having a back and forth. So when Dennis is having a hard time getting out of bed, he often warns me not to call him too early. I'm out there having an early morning walk. And that was quite common uh, with so many of the philosophers that, that you selected. They put a lot of emphasis on their own physical care and meeting people, didn't they? They did. We, you know, we have this impression of philosophers as being these sort of brains in a jar, you know, just free floating, you know, not physical at all, but they were physical, you know, they fought and they drank and, and as you say, they walked a lot. Um, you know, Thoreau would walk four miles through the countryside around Concord every afternoon. Uh, Thomas Hobbes walked so much he had uh, an inkwell built into his walking stick so he could dip his fountain pen in there and jot down his ideas. And Rousseau was the king of the walkers. I mean, he would walk 20 miles in a day and he carried playing cards with him. So if he had a thought, he would jot it down. And there's lots of recent research, particularly done out of Stanford University, that shows a connection between walking and creative thinking. Walking is good for us. It's good for us creatively and it's good for us philosophically. So please, please take, take a walk. And I mean that in the best sense of the word. Well, and as Jim said, you, you talked a lot about walking with these folks. They didn't exactly have... Um, <laughs> bicycles, cars, and trains as you took. But they these folks were characters too. I mean, I, I, I was blown away by some of their, let's just say, personal habits and things. So talk to us about Epicurus as an example, who uh, believed sort of in, I think, living in obscurity versus some of the others like Socrates, who were right. amongst people all the time. Right. So let's, let's, let's time travel real quick back to 300 BC, right? And you're right in Athens. And in the center of the city, you've got Socrates going around badgering people with his questions, and you've got the Stoics, and they've got their school right there in the center of the Agora, the marketplace. And Epicurus says, no, forget that. And he's like a hippie of his day, he hits the road, goes outside the city gates, not that far, but it's outside the gates, sets up, a, finds a garden, builds walls around it. And at the entrance to this garden, it says, Come here, I'm paraphrasing here, if, if you want to experience pleasure of the highest order. So it sounded salacious, uh, and people had all kinds of rumors about what was going on in Epicurus's garden, but really it was not. Um, he believed that pleasure was the ultimate aim of our lives and of philosophy, but simple pleasures. And he, you know, I like to say that all philosophers are misunderstood, none more than Epicurus. When I go around, I talk about Epicurus, people say, oh, that, that website, Epicurus. No, he's, he's considered this gourmet and this, this, you know, foodie. In fact, he's famous for saying, in fact, you know, with the right attitude, even a simple pot of cheese can become a feast. And he thought that we chase these higher pleasures. He called them unnatural and unnecessary pleasures to our detriment. And that really our task is to, to really distill the most pleasure as we can 
from the simplest of activities and foods, et cetera. I mean, moreover, he was comfortable, drink water, don't seek wine. Right, now if you gave Epicurus a glass of wine, he wouldn't turn it down, right? <laughs> he would say, that's good, I'll drink it. But, you know, if he started on the wine, he might develop a real taste for wine and expensive wine, and then he would have to get a better paying job to pay for those expensive wines. And he thought that made you a prisoner right, of your habit, which started off as a pleasure, oh, that's a good glass of wine, uh, becomes a habit that you have to continue. And it becomes a, a cage, a gilded cage that you build for yourself. And, and he very much warned against that. Eric, is Groundhog Day still your favorite movie? Absolutely. In fact, I'm going to watch it right after this program. I'm serious. I haven't watched it yet this week. Um, I, I love it. I love it. It's, 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 it is, it is, I, it, it's funny. It's wise. It's much wiser than people think. It's often labeled a romantic comedy, which it is on one level, but it, it's also, I think, the most philosophical movie ever made. And why? Because you've got the, the character, Bill Murray, who wakes up again and again, same day in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. And then the, the question is, what do you do with that? What would you do if you, Jim, woke up uh, and it was this day over and over again. It, it forces you to look at the choices you make in your life. It, it forces you to look at the kind of life you're leading. Because if, if that day repeats for all eternity and our lives repeat themselves, there's no such thing as, as small moments or, or trivial encounters. Um, it makes you really question um, every action, every thought you have, you know, are you leading the life you want to lead? And, and Bill Murray's character goes through all these stages of denial and, and gluttony and um, eventually arrives at a place of altruism and acceptance. And, you know, that's when Hollywood style, he breaks out of this trap and gets married and lives happily ever, ever after. Well, you mentioned acceptance, which was a big deal to Epicurus, but also a big deal to him was relationships. And Jim and I have done several programs lately, especially during COVID and all about the importance of relationships at this time. So mm. take us through a little bit of that and then jump over to Epictetus and, and the Stoics right. and talk about how maybe someone with the Stoic philosophy is able to get through either the freezing weather in Texas or the COVID. Good, good questions. Well, uh, Epicurus, right, as I said, valued pleasure. And he considered one of life's greatest pleasures was friendship. He said, you should never eat a meal alone like the beasts and the wolves. It's not civilized. You should always eat with a friend. And he considered friendship the greatest source of pleasure. In fact, Aristotle wrote about, um, about friendship and its importance. I know from my research for my book, Geography of Bliss, when I was researching the science of happiness, a consistent finding is that the biggest predictor of anyone's happiness is not money or comfort or, or anything like that. It is relationships, the quality of your relationships. So it is hugely important. And right now uh, we are isolated, right? And that is uh, affecting our happiness. There's no doubt about it. Um, to, to pivot to Epictetus and the Stoics. So Epictetus is a Greco-Roman born a slave, ends up becoming a great teacher and philosopher, sets up a school in Rome and then in, in Greece. And he says, and, and this is an oversimplification, but this is the essence of Stoicism, is we, we do not control external events. Um, if you thought that we did 2020, put an end to that illusion, right? And the storm of 2021, if you're in Texas, you know, if you think you control your external life, you don't. What we do control, the Stoics say, say are our internal reactions to those events. And we tend to, to abdicate that and to say, well, you know, it's, it's cold, it's snowing, there's icy ice on the roads, I don't have my vaccine yet, of course I'm unhappy. And they would say, no, you actually have more control over your reaction. And you need to drop the illusion that you have control over external events. Uh, it, it's, I call it the philosophy for hard knocks. And it's, look, it was enjoying a, a renaissance even before I wrote my book, and it continues to enjoy uh, popularity. There are stoic clubs out there. There's a stoic camp, which I attended in, in Wyoming and highly recommend. And people can't seem to get enough of this 2,000-year-old this philosophy. 
Well, we're living it now. Let me just read a quote that was out of the book that you took from the Roman Senator Seneca. No tree becomes rooted and sturdy unless many a wind assails it, for by its very tossing, it tightens its grip and plants its roots more securely. That really meant it was very meaningful to me. Yeah, there's something to be said for suffering. And I think all of these philosophers, but certainly the Stoics, find value in suffering, meaning in suffering. But growing old doesn't have to be suffering. So tell us a bit about the French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir. Well, she's an existentialist. She's living in Paris in the 20th century. She's drinking white wine and hanging out in cafes. And uh, people who know the Beauvoir would say she's the last person to have a chapter called How to Grow Old Like Beauvoir because she wrote this 600-page book. She's best known as, as a feminist and author, author of The Second Sex. But she also wrote a book about aging called The Coming of Age. Mostly negative, right? Mostly negative saying that, you know, you grow old, you use, lose these faculties, you lose your hair, you lose whatever you <laughs> lose. Um, but, but I started to dig into her life and her writing, but particularly her life, and found that she did age well. She became actually quite politically active well into her 70s, um, and she remained engaged in life. A big stoic uh, concept is projects. You need to have projects. That, that, that's a term they use a lot. And she continued to have projects. She thought it was not enough to have hobbies, especially as you grow older. You need to have a project. A project is something that helps others. It has meaning. Um, you know, knitting can be a hobby if you do it by your, for yourself. It's a project if, if you're giving it to others or selling it on eBay, whatever. Um, but she, she continued to become, to be engaged in life. Um, and she also thought that one thing we could do when we get older is to go back and re-remember our lives, that we construct meaning and uh, memory takes place in the present, not in the past. So yeah, if I were to ask you to remember something, you're, you're doing that here and now. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that's a shame about folks who are suffering from dementia and Alzheimer because they don't have that ability to do that. Let's move to this last one we want to talk about. And that's Rousseau, who you said was the ultimate walker. But I think you described his philosophy as nature good, society bad. Talk about him. Yeah, he was the original nature boy. Um, he's growing up in the age of reason, but he's all in, in the age of the head and he's all about heart. And he believes that basically we're born good and it's society that corrupts us. There was a big debate about this in the 18th century. There's still a debate today. Um, but he was the philosopher of Hallmark cards, of going for a long walk in the woods and getting back to nature. And, you know, sure enough, uh, there's lots of research and scientific evidence that, that shows that being in nature is good for us. You know, if you go for a walk in the city, great. If you go for a walk in the woods, even better. Um, exposure to nature makes us more creative, makes us, us happier. Um, and th that was one of uh, Rousseau's main points of his philosophy. As, and as a romantic, he thought that we were, you know, we're back in the 18th century here, but already he predicted that, you know, we, we're losing touch with nature. And of course, that's only accelerated since then. Eric, we have just a minute or two left, and I want to get a sense of what makes a philosopher in your mind, and because you didn't include Jesus, you did not include really very many non-Western philosophers other than Gandhi, and you didn't include Confucius, but talk with us a little bit more about how does a philosopher break out and really create a movement? Well, I don't know if you need to create a movement to be a philosopher. You need to wrestle with big ideas and in a way that resonates with people. And I go back to that original meaning of the word philosopher, someone who loves wisdom. And I would add, and in that love becomes contagious. So they may not come up with all the answers, but they reframe the questions and in compelling ways that attract other people's interest and other people run with it. Um, you know, getting back to Simone de Beauvoir, um, she recognized that she was going to die. She was now in her late seventies and she realized she didn't have long, but she took great solace in the fact that her projects would live on in the hands of the next generation. 
Um, and, you know, ideally, even though the book is, you know, life lessons in search of dead philosophers, one of my points is they're not really dead. Their ideas live on. Um, they live on in the conversation we've just had. They live on uh, in the minds and thoughts of others who read them and experience them. Uh, Eric, I appreciate we just have a very short time. So very mm -hmm. quickly, what should that viewer remember for this? By the way, this is a project for Jim and me, uh, that what we're doing here, we're trying to leave something for that viewer. What should they remember? And then Jim, I'll give it to you to close. What should they remember? Mm -hmm. You should remember that these ideas and beliefs you walk around with, examine them, question them. Where did they come from? Are they really yours? And if they're not, maybe you should drop some of them and pick up some new ideas. Question your assumptions. And if you sit down, you might realize you have a lot of assumptions that you weren't even aware of. You just took it as the way things are. Maybe it's not just the way things are. You know, I, I think we're living, Dennis and Eric, in such challenging times. And you, you have to wonder how philosophers will, will write about this time and what people will read 50, 100, 500 years from now about our time. Um, and I want to thank you for really making philosophy and, and these dead philosophers accessible to us. And I want to encourage people to, to pick up Socrates Express. And thank you to all of you for joining Dennis and me, spending part of your day with us. We appreciate it very much. If by chance you've missed one of our past programs, you can just go to mcquistontv.com. Please follow us on social media. And remember as well that we are here to bring uh, perspectives that matter to people who care. Thanks again. For more information, call 214-750-5157 or email nickyn at nickymcquistion.com. Visit our website at www.mcquistiontv.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash mcquistiontv or download McQuistion TV video podcast on iTunes.